So here we have the model of the neonatal skull. We can see the prominent uh, fontanelle at the front and at the back. But what we want to think about now is the, is the floor of the mouth. And we can see that the mandible, the lower jaw, is not as proportionately large or rigid as, as it would be in the adult. And basically all of the cartilages in the upper airway of an infant are softer and more flexible than they are in older children and uh, adults. And this lack of rigidity means structures are not fully maintained. Uh, they don't fully maintain their anatomical architecture due to lack of rigidity. And this means there can easily be distortions. And the patency of the upper airway is more likely to be distorted because of this lack of rigidity in the cartilages. So for example, the floor of the infant mouth is less rigid than in the adult. And as we've seen, the mandible is shorter and not as well formed. And what this means is the floor of the mouth is easily compressible. And this is why we must be uh, careful not to distort these tissues when airway, airway management is required. Well, well, you, you catch me with a trachea in front of me. <laughs> in roughly the right anatomical position, so we have the larynx and the thyroid gland and the trachea, and the right main bronchus and the left main bronchus uh, going down to the, uh, the lobar and segmental bronchi. Now, as we've already mentioned, the cartilage comprising the upper airway in infants is relatively soft and pliable. And this is also true of the rings of cartilage supporting the patency of the trachea. And uh, in infants, the airway, uh, the trachea is relatively short and narrow. And this is how wide it is. It's four millimetres. It's the size of this straw uh, in a neonate and uh, young child. Very narrow. Now, the internal diameter of the trachea, trachea does increase throughout childhood and is about the same diameter in uh, millimetres as the child's. Um, age in years. So this tube is uh, seven millimetres, so that would be roughly equivalent to a, a seven-year-old trachea. And in adults, the overall diameter is only 12 millimetres. So the combination of narrow diameter and soft cartilage explains why overextension of the infant neck can cause tracheal stretching. We don't want that. And this means that the infant uh, airway can become compromised with the head if the head's in, in extension position. And this is why airway patency is optimised in infants with the head in the, the neutral position. So we don't want the head to be extended and we don't want it to be flexed. We want it to be in a neutral position because we've only got this, this four millimetres to play with here. So here we see our neonatal skull again and for the first few months of life the nostrils are small meaning the communication from the outside air into the anterior nasal cavity is relatively narrow. So here we have the nasal cavities albeit in an adult model and air gets in through the nostrils or the external nares into the nasal cavities. But despite the nostrils being narrow, neonates and children up to three to six months of age have long been thought to be obligate uh, nose breathers. And this means these young children will be unable to effectively breathe through their mouths. However, babies will breathe through their mouths when they're crying. And in addition, recent, recent studies have shown that um, infants can breathe through their mouths both spontaneously and during a nasal occlusion. Uh, if unable to breathe through the nose, the soft palate will, uh, will, will lift, creating a passage between the tongue and the soft palate means the air can get through the oral cavity.
So normally in the trial the soft palate would be relatively closed near the tongue. So that's the tongue and that's the soft palate they would be closed. But if a baby can't breathe through the nose then they, they should lift their soft palate. And if the soft palate is no longer if the soft palate is no longer in contact with the tongue, if it's opened, that opens that airway just there. And that will allow air to go through the mouth and down into the trachea, which of course is exactly what we need. So what this means is it's probably better to describe children in the first six months of life as preferential nose breathers. But nevertheless, under normal circumstances, neonates and young children do breathe predominantly through the nose. Observation of nasal patency is, of course, a, a very important clinical observation. Uh, upper respiratory tract infections are common in young children, and this will stimulate uh, mucus production from the nasal cavity. And mucus may still block the nostrils, leading to airway compromise. The advantage of nasal breathing, of course, is that young ch children are able to suckle for long periods. So they're suckling through their mouth, milk's going in through there, down through the oropharynx into the esophagus. But at the same time, they can breathe through their nasal cavities. So nasal breathing allows children to swallow without aspiration of milk into the airways. But let's think about the, uh, the tongue now. Here we have the tongue in the mouth. And the tongue grows less than other parts of the body, uh, th therefore it's relatively large in younger children. And if an adult or child is unconscious, the tongue may fall back, obstructing the airway, leading to blockage of the airway with consequent asphyxiation. And as the tongue is larger in children, in comparison to the surrounding anatomical structures, this risk of airway obstruction is increased in, in younger children. And this model shows that here, that the tongue can obstruct the back of the airway. That's why we need to open the airway in older children by extending the airway, in neonates and infants by maintaining a neutral position as we elevate the uh, elevate the shoulders somewhat to put the head into a neutral position now we've already seen that children have a proportionately uh, large head compared to the rest of their body but they also have a proportionately short neck and combined with the large head this tends to cause neck flexion the head is moved forward and this of course can make airway control difficult if the level of consciousness is reduced. Now of course infection of the tonsils are common in children these are the palatine tonsils here and further up we have the pharyngeal tonsils here and when these pharyngeal tonsils are inflamed and enlarged that we for some reason they change their name and we call them the adenoids so these are the adenoids just here and the adenoids and tonsils, like all the lymphoid tissue, will enlarge when it's infected. Now, although lymphoid tissue does act to fight infection, sometimes bacteria and viruses can lodge within the lymphoid tissue itself. And they can actually multiply within the lymphoid tissue, causing infection. And this can lead to chronic infection and subsequent swelling caused by hypertrophy as there's an increase in the size of the cells in the lymphoid tissue. And classically, three to eight year olds are prone to this chronic uh, adenotonsillar hypertrophy. And you can see that because of the position of the adenoids here, or the, the adenoids when they're inflamed, these can inflame really quite significantly and can significantly block off the nasopharynx, because this is the way that the air is getting from the nose down through to the lower parts of the pharynx and the airway. So large adenoids can largely, or even in some cases, block off the upper part of the airway through the nose there at the level of the nasopharynx. And this is the most common cause of uh, obstructive sleep apnea before puberty. 
And if enlargement's an ongoing problem, the adenoids and tonsils may need to be surgically removed. Now moving further down, we now want to think about the epiglottis. This is the epiglottis here. And the epiglottis covers this area here, which is the top of the airway. And this is called the glottis. So the epiglottis is covering the glottis. And the size and proportion of the epiglottis are different in children. In adults, the epiglottis is typically more uh, broad and rigid. And in infants and young children, the epiglottis is relatively large, long and floppy and relatively narrow. And positionally, it also projects posteriorly over the glottis at an angle of about 45 degrees. So the, the epiglottis in children is, is more posterior, projecting more over the opening of the glottis. And the combination of a relatively large epiglottis and the position just above the opening of the airway means that if it becomes inflamed, the swollen structure has the potential to occlude the upper airways leading to obstruction. So the epiglottis is relatively large in children compared to the smaller anatomical uh, size of the anatomical structures around about. And remember in the neonate and infant, this straw is the diameter of the trachea. The tracheal diameter is, is four millimetres. So there's not a great deal of spare anatomical space to maintain the patency of the upper airway. So bacterial infection of the epiglottis in early life can therefore lead to swelling and edema, which may potentially block off the airway. Now epiglottitis is classically associated with the uh, Haemophilus influenzae type B, but with the Hib vaccination, this presentation is much less common. So we see far fewer children coming in with epiglottitis now than we used to. Of course, there's other bacterial infections can cause epiglottitis in children, but we are seeing much less since the introduction of the, the, the Hib vaccine. I actually worked on a local intensive care unit before the Hib vaccine was brought in, and it was quite common that children with epiglottitis will come in for monitoring of their airway. But thankfully, much less common presentation now. Now the larynx is this cartilaginous structure at the top of the airway. This is the hyoid bone, this is the, the large front cartilages of the, the larynx, the thyroid cartilage. And if we open this up, we can see here that we've got the, uh, the vocal cords inside. So these are the vocal cords here. And, and th these are sometimes called the false, vo fo false vocal cords on top. Better to call them the vestibular folds. They, 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 they are protecting the, the upper airway. And this is the epiglottis that would fold down over the glottis during swallowing. And what we see here, this is the cricoid cartilage. That's the front of the cricoid cartilage and that's the back of the cricoid cartilage. Much wider at the, uh, at the back as we probably see on, on this section. So that's the, that's the cricoid cartilage just there, the first full ring of cartilage. Much wider at the back. And part of the reason the neck is shorter in children is that the larynx is shorter and the laryngeal structures are more overlapping. So this is the adult one and we can see there's a nice gap between the hyoid bone and the thyroid cartilage and a nice gap between the thyroid cartilage and the cricoid cartilage. That's the cricothyroid ligament there if you ever need to do an emergency cricothyroidotomy. So in the adult we have this space here and we have this space here but with children they're more compressed and these structures will overlap in the neonate. So in the adult the whole larynx is longer, in the child the whole larynx is shorter part of the reason that the neck is shorter in, in neonates and infants. And this model allows us to uh, equate the position of the anatomical structures with the, uh, with the vertebrae. So this is the part of section of C1 we'd see here, first cervical vertebrae. That's uh, C2 there. 
three, four, five, six, seven. So that would make that the very start of which vertebrae would that be? Well, if that's C7, that's going to be T1, thoracic vertebrae 1 at that level there. And in adults, we can see that the larynx is level with uh, C5 and uh, C6. So at the C5, C6 level in adults. But because in children the neck is much shorter, in children the larynx is more at the level of C2 and C3 making the neck very much shorter in children. And as we've stressed before, all cartilaginous portions of the airway are softer in children and more compliant in infants, especially for the first year of life. And this increases the flexibility of anatomical structures, such as the epiglottis, the larynx, the rings of cartilage that support the patency of the bronchial tree. And stiffening of cartilage progresses throughout childhood in, into the teenage years. It's an ongoing process. Now here we have the, uh, as we've said, the cricoid cartilage is there. That's the front and that's the back of the cricoid cartilage. And again, as infants have a short neck, the cricoid ring is located approximately at the level of C4 uh, in children. C vertebrae C C four so that's two three four so the cricoid ring in a child is right up at about that level there compared to being down here in the adult so at birth this cricoid ring is at about C four three four it's at that level there but at age six the cricoid ring has moved down to the level of C five. So that's two, three, four, five. So it's moved down to there by the time the child is, is six years old. And as we've seen in the adult, as, as, as is illustrated in this model, it's round about the level of, level, of, level of C6. Now in children under the age of 10, the area inside this cricoid ring here, this area here inside the cricoid ring, in children younger than 10, this, this area inside the cricoid ring has been considered to be the narrowest portion of the uh, upper airway within the cricoid ring. And of course, the cricoid ring is a complete ring, as we've seen, it's a complete, complete ring of cartilage. And that's in contrast to the rings in the cartilage in the trachea, which are incomplete to allow the movement of a food bolus down the esophagus. So this cricoid ring is a complete ring of cartilage. Now having said that in children under the age of 10 this area is the narrowest portion of the upper airway, um, some in vivo in life studies have found that the, uh, the glottic opening is smaller at some time, sometimes, so that would be the glottic opening there, as opposed to the gap between the cricoid ring there. But despite this, the distendability of the glottic tissues and the rigid nature of the cricoid cartilage uh, still leads to the effect of this area of the cricoid ring being functionally the narrowest part of the airway. And the airway within the cricoid ring, this area here, the airway inside, is lined by ciliated pseudostratified epithelium. But it's loosely bound to a uh, connective tissue called areolar tissue. And this loose arrangement means the cricoid area, which is already narrow, is prone to edematous swelling. And uh, edema may be caused by any form of inflammation, such as burns or hot gases, allergic or inflammatory actions, and indeed medical interventions. So uh, inflammation there can cause to narrowing of this already narrow part of the child's airway. And this is an important consideration whenever we're thinking about children's airway because uh, resistance to flow in the airway is governed by Purcell's law. And what this means is if the radius of an airway is halved, the resistance to flow will increase by a factor of 16. So any narrowing of any part of the airway is significant in children.